every part of it, everything that our investors have seen, everything. But we asked them to sign a confidentiality agreement. Now, when you're a consultant, this is a standard thing. So you, you agree with the person who's providing the information what you can disclose and what you can't disclose. We made that clear to them. They wouldn't sign it. They didn't want to see our plan. So I'm afraid what Mr. Wells said yesterday was not correct. And the idea that all information received by consultants has to go into the public domain. If everything had to go into the public domain, the reasons for the council, the planning committee's decision in December would go into the public domain, and we know what happens to that. So it is an important point to make because we feel we behaved as openly and as frankly as we could with the council, and um, it's unfair to subject us to this kind of criticism. Um, a couple of other things before I go on to the access. Um, there was a very important announcement made by the government on Thursday, which was the national policy statement in relation to aviation. Um, we have been having a dialogue with the Department of Transport. And, you know, uh, we, we realize that air freight isn't the, 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 the sexiest vote winning subject on the political agenda. So it's been a, it's been a struggle. You know, it's just in the nature of things in our sector, everyone wants to talk about passengers. It's taken, ironically, the Brexit vote to focus the government on the need for trade and international trade outside the EU. So I'm just going to read you a, a short section from um, the government's um, national policy statement. It says, it says as follows. International connectivity attracts businesses to cluster around airports and helps to improve the productivity of the wider UK economy. Large and small UK businesses rely on air travel while our airports are the primary gateway for vital, time-sensitive freight services. Then 2.7 says, air freight is also important to the UK economy. Although only a small proportion of UK trade by weight is carried by air, it is particularly important for supporting exported growth in sectors where goods are of high value or time critical. Heathrow Airport is the UK's biggest freight port by value, much bigger than Felixstowe or any of the other seaports. Over £155 billion pounds worth of air freight was sent between UK and non-European countries in 2015, <coughs> representing over 40% of the UK's non-European Union trade by value. This is especially important to the advanced manufacturing sector, where air freight is a key element of the time-critical supply chain. By 2030, advanced manufacturing industries such as pharmaceuticals or chemicals whose components and products are predominantly moved by air, are expected to be among the top five UK export markets by their share of value. In the future, UK manufacturing competitiveness and a successful and diverse UK economy will drive the need for quicker air freight. And then later on it says, this is paragraph 322, the aviation sector can also boost the wider economy by providing more opportunities for trade through air freight. The time-sensitive air freight industry and those industries that use air freight benefit from greater quantity and frequency of services, especially long haul. By providing more space for cargo, lowering costs, and by the greater frequency of services, this should in turn provide a boost to trade and GDP benefits for the UK. That's an important statement of principle, which has not previously been made um, on behalf of the cargo sector. So, from our point of view, we get site access. The, the government produces this draft uh, consultation paper to which we will be responding. And as far as recognition of the importance of air freight, and we, we will say, of course, the role of Manston in all that, we think that things are looking a lot more optimistic than perhaps they were a year ago. Now, specifically, as regards the access to the site 
and then what happens next, because I know a lot of people are interested in what the program is going to be. We, we will be having the first access this coming Tuesday, the 7th of February. Um, a, a big team of our consultants, myself and my fellow directors included, will be on site from around 9 o'clock in the morning. Yay! We, we had, we speculated about a number of ways of getting publicity for this. Um, starting with the wild swans, which was that all our consultants should arrive by parachute. <laughs> In the end, the, um, the advice of our PR consultants has prevailed, and this is going to be a serious professional exercise with a lot of people in high vis jackets and hard hats. That's how it has to be. So, I'll, what I'm saying to people here is this: we you know, we welcome your support, but Tuesday morning is not the occasion for a for a, a demonstration or anything like that. Um, I just want you to know that we're going there, so that, because I, I also know as you, as you'll be aware that when anything happens on the site, these <laughs> <laughs> you, travels like a wildfire. There will be a large number of cars turning up on Tuesday morning. They're all to do with us. <laughs> and they will also be there on Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. The work will go on as long as it's required. Um, the significance of that, of course, is that we can now make real progress with the process. We were held up. You, you, many of you know that. We, we've done as much as we could off-site, but there are certain key things for which you require site access. There's the basic environmental information about the site, the drainage and, and, and that kind of thing, plus you know, wildlife and the other things that we're obliged to look at. There are also serious issues about levels because we want to uh, carry out a huge amount of um, construction work on site, in particular creating new parking stands, altering the line of taxiways and so on. And quite properly, the environmental regulations require us to do our very best to bring as little as possible onto site by way of external topsoil and, 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 and and other materials, we believe that we can uh, um, alter the levels on site by moving what's there from one part of the site to the other. But it will be subject to very careful scrutiny by the environment agency and the water because there's an aquifer underneath. And the advantage of that will be that the number of truck movements off site will be reduced because we've got to bring hundreds of tons of earth to the site that will require a huge number of truck movements, and we're keen to keep those to an absolute minimum. So it will be intelligence like that that we gain from this exercise. And what, what we committed ourselves to doing is to release the information that we get as and when we get it, so that people are aware of what's going on. So it's no longer a mystery as to what's happening out there. You, you will know exactly what we're doing. And, and, and the information that we're getting. So, where does that fit into the timetable? I'll just, some of you will have heard this, but I'll, there's a bit more detail to it now. So now that we have site access, we're able to move into the final stages of preparing the, the development consent order application. In order to do that, we have to carry out um, a process called land referencing which means we have to write personally to every single landowner or indeed lease owner whose property, the value of whose property might possibly be affected by what we're planning at the airport. Um, the <coughs> exercise of identifying those landowners is now complete. Um, there are several hundred of them. They all have to be written to and advised of their rights to be consulted. Um, when that exercise is complete, and that exercise will take around six weeks, maybe seven weeks, 
we are allowed then to move into the statutory consultation, which will be a repeat of what we did last year, but with much greater definition because we'll have a lot more to tell you. Those statutory consultations will take place probably in the same centres as we held them last time, but there will be a difference. We are this time consulting with the parishes. Um, we won't be able to do a full-blown consultation in every single um, par parish or village hall, but what we will be able to do is to take the team to a parish meeting and have them interrogated by the local community or, or local elected members. So we'll be consulting with them on that. We're also looking to consult with the business community, and we have to also identify all the special interest groups there are in this area of all kinds. So it, you know, it includes the no night flights people, SM, AA, everybody. You're all consultees in this exercise. The rules are very strict. Um, the people whose property values are potentially affected are written to personally. The rest of the community we are allowed to contact by um, mail shot, distribution of leaflets, that kind of thing. But the rules are very strict. We have to do it. We can't just say, here's a website, have a look. You, you, you're not allowed to do that. And if you fall down on that, you get held up and stopped by the, by the planning inspector. The, the consultation exercises, we think, we're still managing the timetable, um, will begin once we have enough information from the site access and the other <coughs> exercises to complete what's called, uh, I thought aviation was bad for the um, acronyms and jargon, um, the environmental world is much worse. Um, they, 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 they have to complete a document called a PEER, P-E-I-R, a Preliminary Environmental Impact Report. The PEER will form the basis of the consultation. So the peer will tell you how many flights they're going to be in year one and as far out as year 20. What the no noise levels will be in year one and year 20, what the truck movements will be, what the air quality implications will be, what the drainage implications will be, etc., etc. It's a very big document. That peer forms the basis of the statutory consultation. A summary of the peer will be circulated and made available, and the full document will be available for inspection, of course. At the end of that consultation process, the consultees, which is the, the community, uh, the statutory consultees, namely the council, the um, Southern Water, the Environment Agency, all those people, Natural England, they have a, a, a set period of time in which to respond. We then have to produce a report which incorporates those of their responses that we think are worthy of being included in the plan. The example I'm currently using because, of, because it's important to us is, is, for example, the eventual location of the museum, the, the Spitfire Museum, where there's a, a lively debate as to whether it should be relocated or not. And those are the kinds of things where feedback to consultation is important. So once that process is complete, we have to publish then an amended peer which takes into account the results of all the consultation. That document, along with various other legal submissions, will form the basis of the actual development consent order application, which we are hoping now we can file by the end of July this year. Brilliant. There's a, there's, a, there's a long road ahead, but that's the target. A huge amount of work is being done. However, and, and, um, before I finish, I just wanted to let you know about some, there are some parallel things going on. You'll be aware that there's a planning of people coming up on the 14th to 17th of March. This relates to the so-called Lothian Shelf application for non-aviation consent on the airport. The council, as you know, originally rejected the application. It put in a very strong case against the appeal, and then as a result of the AVO report and that, that 
famous meeting in December, they decided to withdraw their opposition to it. We are, we remain as the only opponents. There is a public inquiry in, in the middle of March and we will be represented at that inquiry and we will be fighting the case as hard as we can. We are currently preparing for that case and that case will involve the use of specialist advice and reports, some of which you haven't seen yet, um, which will include our response finally to the ABO report. Um, it is important for us, I just wanted to make this point, it's not good enough for us to show that the ABO report, I'm being polite here, is not to be relied upon. We also have to show a positive, we have to show what this airport is capable of <coughs> and why we say it's a project, an infrastructure project of national significance. So those documents will form part of the planning appeal and will appear in the public domain as we get through February and into March. And there will be a public hearing and it's going to be in the council chamber for three consecutive days. A Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. In parallel with that, of course, as you know, um, we have the local plan consultation, which in relation to the Manson area covers the same ground. Namely, we have the ABO report, we want to redesignate the site for something else, namely housing. We will be responding to that with the same case that we'll be using in the planning field. It does raise an a number of interesting issues about timing, because of course the the result of the planning appeal, the Lothian Shelf one, we would normally expect to appear around the end of the summer, maybe early autumn. That's how long these things take. <coughs> By which time, the local plan consultation will have completed its local stages and will be waiting a hearing for a, a different public inquiry by a different inspector. So, quite what happens if the first inspector has rejected the ABO report in relation to the, the second public inquiry for a local plan that relies on the ABO report? Who knows? You know, no one seems to have thought that through. We, we, You're we, talking about the district council. Well, <laughs> you know, I mean, just, just to say, I know some of you follow these things very, very closely. We had a meeting with the planning inspector at, um, two Thursdays ago, at which it was discussed. They published their minutes, and uh, that discussion will, will be reflected in the minutes. It, it's a conundrum. I, I don't quite know where that leaves um, the, the local plan if, if the appeal goes the other way, you know, goes our way. Um, and then, of course, the other, the other issue is the, um, the Stone Hill Park planning act which was filed in, I remind you, in May of last year. Many of you will have read the responses to that from the statutory agency, which I think, and I'm, I'm not being unfair here, can be characterized by, by summing them up as well. We need to know an awful lot more about this before we can comment on it. The additional work to respond to that does not appear to have been done, or if it has, it hasn't appeared yet. And that, that application just sits there gathering dust, as far as we can see. Um, it does put some pressure on us when you read, as we did last week, um, a, a local newspaper piece suggesting that uh, the first houses could start being constructed at the end of this coming year. Um, I, I think that's unlikely. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, I do ask you to just you know, bear, bear that stuff in mind, tip of the pinch of salt. I mean, the reality is, that is an outline application. It's a very general outline application. To get detailed planning consent for that site for housing is a very tall order and will take a very long time to be, even if all the other obstacles that stand in the way disappear. So that, that's where we stand on the housing. Just, just one last point um, is on the forecasts for the airport and its traffic, because I, I think that's that's another point where we've done a lot more work since I last spoke to you. And I just want to um, share some of that with you. It's actually tied in with what Alan Macquarie said yesterday. 
Our focus is on the freight of the market. And, and as many of you will know, the two major freighter airports in the UK are East Midlands and Stansted. They both now happen to belong to the Manchester Airport Group. Manchester Airport itself has some belly cargo, but has no freight of cargo. There is no, there's a small amount of freight of cargo that goes into Heathrow. There is no freight of cargo that goes into Gatwick. There is a persuasive evidence that a lot of the um, cargo that is trucked to and fro through the Channel Tunnel is actually air cargo that is either being flown into Frankfurt or Amsterdam or flown out of Frankfurt or Amsterdam because a freight of slot in London isn't available. The freighter market is very different from the integrated market. The integrators are the FedExes and the DHLs and the UPS and the world. And they are the people who do depend quite heavily on night flights. I would say to you, as far as we're concerned, this is our take on the market at the moment. There is no demand for an integrated presence of NASA. They're all nicely fixed up at other UK airports, thank you very much. So the pressure for them to come in here, and again, this is an important argument in relation to Brexit, because most of the integrators work, packages, parcels, and so on, not all of it, but most of it is intra-European. And depending on the outcome of the Brexit negotiations and, and um, the UK's um, access to the customs union, those guys are going to face some potential problems in the coming months to do with basically paperwork and the kind of procedures that are going to become necessary if there are if we're not in the, um, the customs union. As far as the long haul is concerned, it doesn't apply. It's point to point as it always was. And what we've done is we've looked at the Frankfurt and the Schiphol markets. We've seen that it's at Frankfurt, it's all daytime. There are, there are no night movements at Frankfurt. At Schiphol, there are a small number. We thought, until we studied it, that there were a lot more, but there actually aren't. There are about three or four movements at night at Schiphol. We are satisfied, as things stand, that we can function with a daytime operation with freighters. And of course, the other thing with freighters is they're big aeroplanes. Now, big aeroplanes are noisier than smaller aeroplanes. The big aeroplanes don't fly with the same frequency as smaller aeroplanes. So to achieve the number of movements that we're looking for, we're talking about perhaps one movement an hour, something like that, as compared with the number of movements you get for passenger aircraft. Essentially, and this is uh, just to sort of let you in on the thinking, what we've concluded is this. The cargo market for London is artificially constrained for the London system. You can't get into London. And if you can't get into London, you give up and you go somewhere else. That's what's happened with the, the people who used to carry the perishables into Manston, as Alan Macquarie said yesterday. It's a small example, but there are bigger examples. If you look at what's going into Frankfurt and into um, Amsterdam and what's leaving Frankfurt and Amsterdam, you can trace the origin of a lot of that back to the UK. The other advantage that freighter movement has is it can go to destinations that are not served by passenger planes. Any cargo, by definition, can only go to somewhere where the airline is taking passengers. Freighters can go to other places. There are hundreds of major Chinese manufacturing centers well, I certainly haven't heard of, to which there are no passenger connections, but to and from which there are freighter movements into various European airports. This is the kind of thing that I'm convinced the government has in mind in its, in its policy statement, and that's the additional flexibility that the, 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 the freighters can give you. So, where we are is, I think if I can sum this up, is by saying, Because of political changes in the last 12 months, government support for what we're seeking to do here, no, well, government 
of support, yes, but government attention on what we're seeking to do here has become a lot more focused. There really isn't anywhere in the London, else in the London system that can provide this extra space. I mean, there really isn't, and contrary to what you know, some of the people have said, there isn't. The only place with any headroom at all is Stansted. Stansted has one runway. A, a, a cap of 35 million passengers, it's already on 26 million passengers, and its ambitions are to increase its passengers, not its cargo, because they only have the one runway, and, and uh, for an operation like that, the cargo that the passenger operation is much more profitable. <coughs> the final point about passengers, because I, I know I'll be asked about this, our position has not changed. And, and ironically, this was even sort of reflected in the APU report. We have a continuing dialogue with, with Ryanair. It's out there now, so I'm happy to mention the name. As we do with KLM. The position with KLM, I think we can say with some certainty, is if we're able to give them the guarantees that they would be given a fair run at it this time, they will come back. Yay! And the reason I say that is that it, they, it replicates what they do out of a number of UK regional airports, feeding into Schiphol, and they've all been very successful. They know how it works, they know how quickly it builds up, and they were well on the way to establishing a good link from here. And as far as Ryanair are concerned, they'll base two, three, or four aircraft here. They'll take a few, they won't pay much. It'll be up to us as the owners and operators of the airport to, to build or to recreate a passenger terminal that's, that, that throws off enough revenue for us as the airport owners um, and gets over the difficulty that Ryanair won't pay very much. But we've done that so That's how it is. The one thing they do is, you know, they get 90% occupancy of their aircraft. Yeah. Each of their aircraft seats 189 passengers, so that there's about, you know, there's an average of 170 people on each of those aircraft. And as, the, as they say, we give you the footfall through your car park and through your terminal. It's up to you then to persuade your customers to spend money. It's a challenge we're, we're willing to accept. So it's, it's never going to be a huge passenger airport. But we think that we can support anything up to 2 million passengers a year going primarily to leisure destinations in southern Europe with perhaps some connections to places like um, Dublin and, um, and Edinburgh. So um, that's really a summary of where we are. If I've forgotten anything, I didn't have a list yet. No, I haven't. Um, if, if you want to ask me questions now or later or informally when I've sat down, please feel free. And just lastly, thank you for your support. I mean, it's just really you know, two days running. Some people sat through four hours yesterday. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it was all very, very uh, stimulating. But you know, four hours is four hours. Um, so, you know, as one of my American colleagues keep, keep saying to me, you guys over here are just incredible. And you just proved, you know, proved it again today. So, thank you very much. Wait, what else?